let's say you're a scientist who is really interested in a particular population of grapes. Mm, probably sounding less like you. While you're out observing your precious babies, you find that grape color is a Mendelian trait and that the red allele is dominant over the white allele. Nice job. Ah, but you? When it comes to grape science, you're insatiable. And you just have to know if the color trait in your grape population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. This all may sound oddly specific, but it's actually a really convenient situational segue. Because we're here at the gorgeous Hardy's Winery, a vino paradise crafted by Dionysus himself. Man, <laughs> just kidding. It's basically all jug wine from here on out. So, for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, there are five rules, or conditions, so to speak, that the population must meet. These are called Hardy-Weinberg assumptions. If any of these five assumptions are violated, evolutionary forces are acting on the genetic variation of the population, and the population is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Without further ado, the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions are no mutations, random mating, no natural selection, large population size, and no gene flow. Let's go through each of these briefly. Whew, boy, take a look at those glowing Chernobyl clusters. Those could not be USDA approved. Mutations modify the gene pool, and they can delete, duplicate, or alter a particular gene. So, for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, mutations must not have occurred. So, uh, you're just gonna cut those mutants off and look the other way on this? I won't say anything if you don't. Next, mating must be random. Kind of like a good old-fashioned game of spin the bottle. Never know who you're gonna make out with. Ha bup 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 No cheating, David. I see you. Random mating means that gametes all have an equal chance of being paired with each other. Think of it this way. Do you have a preference for tall people? How about short? Nope, not in Hardy-Weinberg, you don't. Side note, we do not encourage bearing children with people selected at random. Please choose your mates wisely. Hardy-Weinberg also assumes that no natural selection is taking place. This means that all individuals have an equal chance of surviving and reproducing. Yeah, get out of here, birds. You leave those highly visible white grapes alone. The scarecrow here is doing an excellent job of ensuring that all grapes have an equal chance of surviving. Wow, that is a giant tour group. Anyway, let's talk population size and think big because the size of the population needs to be large for Hardy-Weinberg to apply. If you have a small population, the chance of allele frequency changing due to random chance is pretty high, a concept known as genetic drift. Large populations ensure stable allele frequency. Last, Hardy-Weinberg assumes that no gene flow is occurring. Gene flow refers to the transfer of genes from one population to another. Or, from a more alcohol-related standpoint, no additional wine is allowed inside this barrel labeled with a guy in genes, and definitely no wine is allowed to leave. Trust me, that thing is forever in the off position. Disappointed patrons everywhere. So, I've said Hardy-Weinberg a whole mess of times, and you're probably dying to see the equation. Okay, quick side vent. Why did they choose P and Q as the variables? Was it so someone could make a joke about minding their P's and Q's doing population genetics calculations? I resent the dad joke, but respect the long play. <sighs> but yes, here it is, sitting in all its dad jokey glory. The Hardy-Weinberg equation is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1, which you can see here in the square P wine box, these two PQ barrels, and the square Q wine box all conveniently located next to one ton of the finest and, most notably, probably not mutated grapes. Now, before we get into all the details of the full-blown Hardy-Weinberg equation, let's take a look at the variables P and Q, as well as a simpler equation that the Hardy-Weinberg equation is derived from. Ooh, check out those flavor profiles. Would you prefer the powerful dominant flavor of the Pinot Noir, or the quiet recessive flavor of the Quagliano? How about a nice Merlot? Not an option, David! If you recall, P represents the frequency of the dominant allele at a particular locus, and Q represents the frequency of the recessive allele at that same locus. To reiterate, P and Q are the frequency of alleles at a given locus in a population. Not genotype, not phenotype, alleles. To reiterate again, P and Q are frequencies hence the bolded F in flavor. As frequencies, 
P and Q can never be less than zero or more than one. Like I mentioned before, the Hardy-Weinberg equation is actually a derivation of a simpler equation. P plus Q equals one. Huh. One dollar? Kind of makes you think something is wrong with this wine. Uh, let's just move on. So if you look at all of the P and Q alleles at a locus with two alleles, the sum of P and Q must equal 100%, or one, right? There are no other options. That's to say, if the frequency of the recessive allele is 0.7, for example, the frequency of the dominant allele must be 0.3. Okay, now we can start dissecting the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Let's do this with the hypothetical alleles big A and little a. P squared is the frequency of the homozygous dominant, or big A, big A individuals, which you can see in these light fixtures above the squared P crate. Likewise, Q squared is the frequency of homozygous recessive, or little a, little a individuals. Hence the two light bulbs with the little a filaments above the square Q crate. And the two PQ allele gluttons get the best of both worlds. These are the heterozygous, or big A, little a individuals. And yep, one of each light type. If an individual is heterozygous for a trait that's autosomal recessive, that individual is considered a carrier. Hence this wine carrier underneath the heterozygous PQ barrels and big A, little a lights. As you probably already know, carrier status is really important when considering autosomal recessive diseases like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. But what if the trait isn't autosomal at all? What if the locus of a particular allele exists on the X chromosome? In other words, what if the trait is sex-linked? In this case, the frequency of an X-linked recessive disease in males is simply Q. A male can't be Q squared, right? That's why this man was, er, affected by only a single Q wine bottle. You put your suspenders on backwards there, bud. You doing all right? <laughs> Similarly, a male can't be a carrier either. He either expresses the trait if he harbors the recessive allele, or doesn't, if he has the dominant allele. No middle ground here. Females, on the other hand, can be homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive for an X-linked trait since females have two X chromosomes. So the frequency of an X-linked recessive trait in females is Q squared. That's why it took a whole Q square wine box to get this lady patron here with an X crossed purse toasty. And that brings us to the end. Are you feeling as buzzed as I am? Now, normally we would do a quick outro here, but you know what sounds more intoxicating? A sample question. Let's take a shot at one, eh? Okay, I swear I'm done with booze puns. Also, who takes shots of wine anyway? That was my bad. All right, here we go. Tay-Sachs disease is an autosomal recessive disease caused by the accumulation of the cell membrane glycolipid GM2 gangliocide within lysosomes. This rare disease affects one in 360,000 of the general population. Assuming that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, what's the frequency of carriers in the general population? This question stem gives us the incidence of an autosomal recessive disease, and we know these individuals express the trait. That means they have two copies of the recessive allele. So one in 360,000 is Q squared, right? To find Q, we take the square root of Q squared. The square root of 1 over 360,000 is 1 over 600. From here, we can plug our value for Q into the equation P plus Q equals 1. That gives us a P value of 599 over 600. Cool, we have both P and Q as well as Q squared. Now we can use these values in the Hardy-Weinberg equation to find the frequency of heterozygotes since the question is specifically asking about carriers. Heterozygotes are represented by 2pq, so 2 times 599 over 600 times 1 over 600. To save time, just assume that 599 over 600 is approximately 1, so that gives us 2 over 600, or 1 over 300. The Tay-Sachs carrier frequency in the general population is approximately 1 over 300. So that answers our question. But a question on the exam might prompt you to do an extra step where you're asked to calculate the probability that a known carrier and a random gamete donor in the population would produce a child affected by an autosomal recessive disease. In this instance, you have to multiply the probability that the known carrier passes down the recessive allele by the probability that the donor is a carrier by the probability that the donor passes down the recessive allele. 
we already know that the chance a carrier passes down the allele is 1 in 2. So let's focus on the donor. We already calculated the frequency of heterozygotes in the first part of this problem, approximately 1 in 300. So the chance the donor is a carrier is 1 in 300, and the chance that the carrier donor passes down the recessive disease allele is 1 in 2. Multiplied together, the chance that the donor is both a carrier and passes down the recessive allele is 1 in 600. Now we can multiply this by the chance that our known carrier passes down a recessive allele. So 1 over 2 times 1 over 600 equals 1 over 1200. There's a 1 in 1200 probability that a known carrier would have a child with Tay-Sachs disease when reproducing with a random donor. Another way to answer this question is by drawing a Punnett square. The probability of two carriers producing a Tay-Sachs baby is 1 in 4. The probability of a known carrier mating with another carrier is 1 in 300. If we multiply 1 over 4 times 1 over 300, it equals 1 in 1200. And there you have it. Now you should be able to absolutely plaster any Hardy-Weinberg problem you get on the step. <coughs> yeah, I know I promised no more booze puns, but... Uh... I think four out of the five of those spin-the-bottle oglers are glowing. Is that... normal? Okay, that's my cue to leave. I think I'm growing something I'm not supposed to.